What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and we finally reached the end of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. We're going to be talking about puzzles contained in Tasha's Cauldron. This is the last section within the Dungeon Master's Tools chapter of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I have a couple videos touching on some Tasha's Cauldron things after the fact, but they're not going to be actually diving into really specifics in the book. I have a couple things. One thing that I thought was really weird that didn't make a lot of sense that I think might have been an oversight on Watsy's part. One thing that is a kind of commentary on the book as a whole, and another is a fixing the sorcerer video using the aberrant mind sorcerer, as we've kind of discussed already. That being said, thank you to all of you who have come out all of a sudden in recent support or re-support of the channel. Uh, I like jokingly made that comment about like, hey, comment either way, it helps the algorithm. And a ton of you were just like, algorithm, algorithm, comments, which is just crazy. Uh, so anyway, having engaged fans uh, just makes me feel way better than like huge numbers on the channel. Numbers are obviously good as in certain aspects, but engaged fans are almost always arguably a better thing because I can do more things and get more feedback from all of you because you're more engaged than just having, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers, uh, which again, I'm not turning that down. If that's an option that's on the table, I'd love that too. But I just thought I'd give a little channel commentary there. So as I stated uh, kind of at the end of the last video, I don't want to go through every single puzzle and I really don't want to go through them in depth because as I stated in that, and I'll just give you a quick recap, puzzles in my mind are only fun the first time, right? Uh, if you're running the game or if you're, if you're a forever DM, like I find myself being a lot of the time, then you can run puzzles multiple times for multiple groups. And that could be an own fun thought experiment for you in and of itself to say like, okay, I'm gonna run this puzzle for this group, see how they do. Then I'm gonna run that puzzle for this group and see how they do. And that's fun to me because I have found like, I've run a bunch of different puzzles, but even encounters, the same encounter with a bunch of different groups and it always goes different. And you know, a lot of the times different than you actually expect. Some people will just get it immediately because they know it, they're quick witted, they figured it out. Some of them will do literally everything other than what they're supposed to do uh, and still find a way through it. Others will just flounder and then, you know, you have to make a choice of what you're gonna do going forward. So that being said, uh, I don't wanna go through it because also, if you're a new DM out there, this Tasha's Cauldron is like a, I feel like in a lot of ways, a love letter to new new DMs and, and advanced players to give you credence to allow you to do things that a lot of folks who are comfortable with DMing have done for a long time via homebrew, but putting it in this book makes it okay, as it were, for newer folks to like, oh, well, the wizard said it's okay, so I can do it. And again, I know for you veterans out there, that seems silly, but I've seen it in the comments on these videos alone that people wait for wizards to tell them that it's okay to like change a, a you know a proficiency for a race because it doesn't fit your background or it doesn't fit your race or your specific character and make it something else. Some people needed it in a printed book to make it feel like it's okay to use at their table, and that's fine. Uh, so again, like I was saying, with puzzles, I don't want to ruin them for people because new DMs who are using this book will more than likely dive into these 13 puzzles that are here and use them in their games. So you have the potential to encounter these if you're playing with a newer DM or you're playing with a new group. In running into one of these puzzles is possibly a pretty high probability. Now there's other puzzle resources out there. If people are particularly quick-witted, they can come up with them on their own. But that being said, uh, we're gonna talk about how the puzzles work what the sort of rules are. And we're gonna go over the one that was released in Dragon Plus. I thought that that was like an early preview of one of the puzzles contained in this book. And it turns out it's actually just a bonus puzzle, probably something that got scrapped, didn't make it into the book, and landed on the cutting room floor, etc. So they released it for free. So that'll give you a concept of what, to, what these will be like. So we're gonna jump over to D&D Beyond. And here we are in the puzzles chapter, right? So it says, uh, devious traps and multifaceted mysteries might be staples of fantasy adventures, but they're not the easiest challenge for a DM to present on the fly, which is true, right? Thinking of, I feel like that's something that I, if I'm gonna spend a lot of time on DM prep, I can come up with encounters on the fly and just make stuff up as I go along, make up magic items and whatnot. But puzzles, if you want a puzzle to do well, in my mind, you need to sit down and really focus on it uh, because you want it to 
come across clearly, but also be fun for the players to engage in. So this section presents a selection of puzzles designed to invite group participation and challenge the adventures of any stripe. So why use puzzles? Now, I feel like most of us can figure this out, but let's, let's see what they have to say in the book here, right? They provide exciting opportunities to use wit to overcome obstacles and allow characters to collaborate to make discoveries. And that's true, right? If you have a very combat heavy party, and this is something you'll figure out as you DM over time. If you have a party of folks that are super combat heavy or players that are super focused on combat, then puzzles may not be the best fit, but you might find that your players have a mixture of both. And while some of them might not love the combat, but they participate like a, a chance to flex their brain and not just their character's brain, but their player brain might be a big deal for them. So then we'll, there's just a specifics to that I want to talk about too. So it says, you might add a puzzle for one of the following reasons. To encourage a party to discover information through teamwork, right? If your party is having trouble gelling as a team, throwing a puzzle at them where they need to critically think together, it's the same concept of like an escape room, right? People, you got to think together and figure out what you're going to do to get out of an escape room. So the same thing kind of happens here with a puzzle. To provide an opportunity for characters to use their skills in uncommon ways, assuming you are going to use statistics in the game, which we'll talk about. To make a setting feel more whimsical, mysterious, or otherworldly, right? If you're doing a Feywild campaign or something like that, or you're in the Feywild, that's kind of a whimsy, mystical thing. So puzzles can kind of make sense. If you're running a Zelda-style game, we all know puzzles are huge in Zelda games. Uh, using equipment and different things that you found along the way, maybe you can use that and, and use this to inspire, uh, you know, or Zelda dungeons in general to inspire this. To explain why no one has ever discovered something hidden close at hand. That's a huge one, right? If if this is legendary sword or this legendary relic or something like that, and it's been in the town all this time, uh, it kind of sours the moment roleplay-wise. If you're like, well, if this has been here for centuries, how has no one found this? Oh, no one was clever enough to solve the puzzle to get the thing. That explains why. To reveal a secret no one knows and magic can't reveal it. That's also a big one because... And you might have to come up with creative ways for this on the fly if you don't think of it ahead of time. Magic fixes a lot of problems. And that is the biggest detriment to DMs, puzzles, and things like that, and specific dungeon crawls, uh, is just how quickly a magic user, especially a higher level magic user, can just shut down everything. Right? You might have this, oh, we got to think about how we're going to clever to cross this lava pit to get to the other side. And the wizard just casts wall of force over top of the lava and you just walk across and you just made an invisible bridge, right? Or, man, we can't find a way out of this room. Well, somebody casts pass wall and it makes a literal doorway where there was none and they just walk through the wall. Uh, again, things like that can happen and completely shut these things down. So the reason that X information, item, whatever might not be revealed is because it's in an anti-magic field, right? And that's why magic can't scry on this device or this thing to find it. So a puzzle, you have to do the puzzle. And I think sometimes veteran players kind of get this, like you put the puzzle there for them to do the puzzle, not for them to think about how they're going to get around the puzzle. And sometimes, and it goes both ways. I've seen it both ways, right? Where people will be like, well, my character has a specific feature, spell, item, whatever, that will literally let me bypass every part of this puzzle. And I could do that. And maybe, and sometimes, you know, people that want to engage in the puzzle will like, okay, I'm letting you know, DM, this is in my back pocket. I can do this if you'll allow it. I want to try to do the puzzle as the puzzle, though. And then maybe if we get stuck, we can use this as a way to explain how we get out of it which does feel a little bit better than the DM just constantly having to give you hints to like push you in the right direction to get through it. Uh, and it says right here, even as my description is an example here, puzzles can take a long amount of time. My descriptions of how these work took a long amount of time there, but that's also something to consider. So it says, be mindful of how often you use them. Remember, most puzzles don't need to be solved immediately and they might be all more satisfying if their riddles linger unresolved for multiple sessions. That's big. I mean, so think about that, right? How it says. Now, if this is like a true Zelda dungeon, certain areas of like a Zelda dungeon or something like that, where you go in, you find you can't get past X thing because the puzzle, you don't have the key, you don't have the item, you don't have whatever to get to where you need to go. You could go in, figure out you can't do it because of the riddle or whatever it is, leave and then come back. And that is almost, that's, you guys all know what I'm talking about when you get, you're playing a video game 
and you can't get to that chest that's up on the high thing because you haven't unlocked double jump yet. So you have to go find where you learn double jump to come back to this place to go back and get that thing from the start. You all know what I'm talking about. So that kind of concept, that can actually be very satisfying in a D&D &D game. It'll be sour in the moment that they can't do the thing they want to do, but it'll be all that much sweeter when they go away, find the thing, and then someone makes the connection, oh, shit, that's the thing, that's the key to that door that we went into that we couldn't figure out from, like, session five. Let's go back and do that now, and that'll have the payoff, and that'll be good as long as the payoff of what they're going to find is good. That's a cool thing. Uh, if you put this in a dungeon where, like, they're going in the dungeon crawl and they get into the room and doors slam on all four sides and they can't get out and the puzzle is the only way to progress either backwards or forwards, that can be a problem because they are stuck in that room and if they don't figure out the puzzle, then the game just stagnates while they try and think about it. And I'm sure you've seen this. You might have even seen this in some streams and stuff where people are like, they get into the puzzle room and everybody's all excited. And then we're like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And the DM's just kind of doing one of these. And the players are just like, <sighs> and then you can see the DM like tr wants to give hints and maybe they will. So it's just tricky. And I'll say that specifically to that point I just made. Think if you are a streamer or a content creator, if you're doing podcasts, it's a little bit different or actual plays, that kind of a thing. But if you're doing a true streamed game, consider this before you put a puzzle in your game. Unless the players are really actively engaged in a creative thinking process, talking out loud, brainstorming, let's try this, let's try that, what could happen, here we go. That's good, that's good, that's entertainment, that's fun, right? But if they're just sitting there like writing notes, trying to figure it out, crossing things, is this how it works? I don't know. And it's silent. That is boring. That is not entertaining. And people will click away from your video, your stream, whatever, because it's just not fun to watch. So think about that, right? If any heist movie you've ever seen where they have to figure out how they're going to go through and do the heist, obviously puzzles are a little bit different. But even think about any kind of Indiana Jones, The Mummy, those kind of movies where they're solving a puzzle, they don't sit there and think on the puzzle for a half an hour, mostly because it's entertainment, i.e. streaming a game, so it needs to be quick. But the difference with that is it's a script, and people know what's going to happen so they can act it out. If it's being determined real time, that can be boring. You may decide, hey, folks, we're going to take a break right now, and maybe they can work on it over the break and come back. Maybe you end the session early and come back, but then that runs the risk of, well, it will be interesting for the, the viewer base, the audience, to see the process happen, but it's also not super fun to watch the process happen. So something to consider. All right, moving on. Puzzle elements. Here we have the different elements of said puzzle. They give a difficulty of easy, medium, or hard. This book has three easy, six medium, and four hard. Uh, puzzle features. The section features an overview of the puzzle's features and how they can be interacted with, the solution to solve the puzzle. Hint checks, it says, this section suggests hints that characters might use their skills to reveal. Provide one or more of the hints if the characters get stuck. If a character has proficiency in a hint's associated skill, give them that hint if they ask for your help. That's also something that I don't feel like comes up a lot. I feel like, or it might become an issue with the party, where like some people figure out because it's D&D &D and I'm doing this, they don't want to they don't want to just be like, hey, can I get a hint? Because that doesn't seem like how D&D &D works where you're like, well, I'm in this combat encounter. Hey, can I get a hint, DM? Normally, you don't do that. Puzzles a little bit different, um, but people might not ask for it. But uh, also some people be like might be like, no, 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 no. Don't give me a hint. I don't want a hint. Let's try to figure this out. And then that can cause the schism in the party because like I want the hint, but I don't. So how are we going to do this? And then it has some stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, for customizing the puzzle. It explains how to integrate the puzzle into your adventures, alter its difficulty, or adjust other elements. So then we have the hints section we just talked about. It says uh, some that they have a hint here to help you solve it, which is good because, again, like I said, you don't want to stagnate the game as people are trying to solve a puzzle. So each hint is associated with a skill and a DC. If a character in the party has proficiency in a skill related to the hint, share that hint with them. Don't make them roll. They just know because they're proficient. If the same skill is listed multiple times with the same or higher DCs, reveal hints with the lowest DC first 
enhance with a higher DC if the group requests additional help. If no character has proficiency in any of the listed skills, characters can make ability checks using the listed skills. Those who succeed on the check learn the hint. Don't hesitate to reveal hints to the party. Hints provide characters with relevant skills the, uh, skills the opportunity to shine, even if they're not particularly cunning. Additionally, if party members have backgrounds or campaign experiences that might tie into a puzzle, those make great reasons to provide characters with additional hints. So this sort of touches on, and maybe it'll be discussed in the next section here, but this sort of touches on an issue that I see come up a lot, and I don't really know the right way to handle it. I'll tell you how I do it, and then we'll go from there the concept of player knowledge versus character knowledge. I might be like a quiz puzzle master, and this is what I do in my spare time. I go to escape rooms every weekend, or I did when I was a thing I could do. I play, you know, puzzle solving board games, I do murder mystery stuff. I do all this kind of things where I try to solve puzzles and I'm super quick witted, but I'm playing a six intelligence barbarian, right? How does that work in game? This is sometimes a really big issue for people and sometimes it's not at all. Right. So me, Ted, the player might be able to immediately start figuring out the thought process we need to go down to solve the puzzle we're in. But my character, Bob, the barbarian, has a six intelligence and he's been kind of like a, a doofy, uh, you know, I'm going to smash stuff. I'm kind of silly. I don't really interact in social encounters. I make a lot of flubs and that kind of things when it comes to social stuff. But I'm there to support the party, pick the carry the heavy stuff and smash things when things need to be smashed. How does Bob all of a sudden then automatically start going down a critical thinking path and figure out where we need to go? For some groups, and I will say this is true, for some groups, this becomes a big issue, right? They say, well, Bob wouldn't know. He's got a six intelligence. But my character, you know, Alara the wizard has a 20 intelligence. And I don't have any concept whatsoever, the player, any concept of what's going on. I don't get it at all. But like Alara would because she's super smart, right? I, and that becomes like a thing that people get into. How do we handle this? The smart, bar the smart player, Barbarian, the player gets it, the Barb doesn't. The wizard, the wizard would get it, but the player doesn't. How do we handle that? And I've seen it go both ways. Uh, when that's where kind of the concept of these hint checks that are tied to ability scores might be useful and skills where, hey, Alara the Wizard has a history and an arcana, arcana check that's very high and she's proficient. She can maybe figure it out with checks. I personally, when I put a puzzle in a game, I throw characters out the window. The puzzle is the puzzle. It's for the players to solve, right? In one of my very early campaigns uh, that I streamed here on the channel, I think I did... I put the Die Hard water puzzle, you know, Die Hard 3 water puzzle in the game. Now, I knew my players had seen Die Hard, but it was a fun callback to Die Hard. And they thought like, oh, hey, let's do that. Right. With the with the water jugs. Now, both of the characters, middling intelligence, middling to low intelligence in this party. But the players love puzzles. So that's how I handle puzzles in my games. I don't let. Unless they specifically request like, hey, we're not getting it, but my character would. Then we go down the route of hint checks and ability checks and so on. But for me, when I run a game, a puzzle is a chance for the party and the players to work together to solve it, right? Not the characters. So I let that's how I run puzzles at my table. It's an opportunity. Like I put the puzzle, I present it. And then like I did one just the other day, I did, the, I did a review on Wally DM's puzzle uh, book. So I used one of those puzzles in the game and I let the players just figure it out. It wasn't that the character figured it out. It was the, the players figured it out. And I think personally, and I'd love to hear your opinion. Seriously, please let me know because if I have these questions, I'm sure other DMs and players have these questions as well. Let me know in the comments. How do you run puzzles in your games? Do you make people live in their character and that like if their character is dumb, then the, the they can't participate in the puzzle, which is also shitty right like if i play a dumb character then i'm just out for this whole puzzle like i can't do anything which is even weirder if my scenario from before where i have bob the barbarian like does bob provide false information to throw the party off the trail because bob is dumb but ted the player is intelligent and doesn't want to 
meta game that he knows the answer or has figured it out. Like that's a weird thing. You get what I'm saying? Like, do I purposefully sabotage my party to play my character? Uh, do I just sit there bored and can't do anything because my character's dumb? Or do I, Ted the player, get to say, hey guys, I think we might go down this route. And now we're not in character mode, we're in player mode. And then we present that to the DM and go from there. Things to consider. And then we have running puzzles here. Once you've presented a puzzle to a group, feel free to add and clarify details as you would in any other type of encounter. Try not to give away details of the puzzle's solution in your descriptions, but there's nothing wrong with letting a hint slip here or there. That's something to consider too. Uh, because unless you have a physical prop, which is cool if you have those, and there's handouts for these uh, for a couple of these as well. If you have a physical prop for things that you can do where you can like, hey, here's it, like it's a, give somebody a Rubik's cube and you know, figure it out, right? Uh, obviously that's not a great one unless people really understand how to do a Rubik's cube in your group, but like that's a physical prop that people can touch and manipulate and alter and figure out how things are gonna work. Uh, that's great. I think that that's fantastic. Um, that obviously doesn't work if you're not playing at a physical table because people can't touch the Rubik's cube. Uh, but those are really good. But also remember, even though in your brain, and this is a general encounter, you know, 101 for a DM, but just because the puzzle makes sense the way you're describing it in your head, and the puzzle is usually very critical for the players to understand the scenario and everything involved. If they don't get it, then the puzzle won't work the way they want it to because they're going down a thought process that the puzzle looks like this, and actually it's something else. So you need to make sure you do a really good job explaining things. And again, like it says, don't feel bad about going back and clarifying. Hey, I, you know, or if you see them struggling because they're describing the fountain that you're talking about in a completely, maybe you described it one way and they took it another way. Well, you just, hey guys, time out. Listen, I just want to explain because I think we might be having an issue here. The fountain actually looks like this and then like maybe do a little quick sketch and draw it out or whatever it is. And then further explain it. So just throwing it out there. Now that kind of gives a hint right there if they're going down a different route and like the shape of the fountain is important and they don't understand it. You might be giving them a hint in the right direction, but that you, there's no way to get around that. You kind of just have to do it. Like I said, unless you have something physical, a representation in some way that they can manipulate to figure it out. It says, don't worry, uh, oh, and they have it here, but I already touched on my piece, but it says, don't worry whether it's a player or character who's solving a puzzle. While hint checks provide a way for a character to experience to contribute to a puzzle solution, ultimately the boundaries between a player and character's ability to solve a puzzle isn't as important as the group enjoying the challenge. However, if a player knows the answer to a puzzle in advance, urge them to share only hints their characters learn. After presenting a puzzle, encourage the party to solve it together, to pool hints, and to share their insights. Work with the group to share any puzzle handouts and take turns talking through their thoughts. Ultimately, solving a puzzle will be a victory for the whole group, not one individual. So they actually put a piece in there, which I didn't know uh, was going to be in there, about the character and the player. And so I agree with that wholeheartedly. That pretty much falls right into what I was discussing before. Don't separate them out. Let them do what they want to do and use the hints to help us characters and the player to figure it out. Uh, again... But I've seen that at tables where people will be like, my character's dumb, I can't participate. And they will self-check themselves out of it, which I don't think that's a great idea. So that's puzzles in the book. Then we go on to have the 13 puzzles and then the handouts at the end. I did want to put, I'll put a link to this in the description. This is one of the more recent Dragon Pluses. This is from uh, October of this year. Uh, and it says free bonus puzzle display of daggers. And if you click it, it actually takes you to, I guess this was probably a puzzle that got cut, like I said at the start, that didn't make it into uh, the final product, but it is still a puzzle that follows those same set of rules. So we see here's the description of the puzzle. It goes on to do the puzzle features. It talks about all the different areas in there. It gives you what the solution to the puzzle is the various hint checks that you can do, and then some options for customizing the puzzle as well as the handouts to print it out. Now, I haven't looked at this puzzle since I did the review of it back in October when it came out, but basically it has to do with a bunch, it's a blacksmith and there's a bunch of different weapons. So it's a workshop, right? It says right here, he's been making various things. There's an altar, there's a bird cage. Uh, the, bird has, the bird can say some things that might give you some hints in the right direction. Squeaking Moradin. 
there's daggers, there's a desk with some sketches, and um, he, the, the, mel the blacksmith is actually dead himself, and there are swords, right? Four finely crafted weapons. From left to right there, an adamantine scimitar, a, bra a bronze wood, which I think is supposed to be bronze wood, short sword, a mithril great axe, and a true steel pike, which I also thought was interesting in this that gives us sort of bronze wood and true steel as materials that we have not established that they exist in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, but anyway. Uh, and then the solution is, to solve this dagger code, characters must first decode. I'm not going to go through this because, I, like I said, I already covered it. But they must decode the notes around uh, found in the desk drawer, and basically you're making kind of a cipher out of this, right? Once the characters learn the letters, they should be able to recreate the word Morden on the altar with the daggers from all over the shop. They can do this by writing out the code and so on. And then once the, they learn the code, they can spell out Morden. And then uh, the sword begins to vibrate. And there you go. Uh, Clegg's soul departs the sword. His soul got trapped in the sword. And he returns to one hit point. And then here I just wanted to look at the hint checks, right? There are two. A nature check with a DC 15. And a wisdom perception check with a DC 10. So the intelligence nature check is... If at least half of the letters of a single material in the notes bronze and bronze wood are solved, but the characters are stuck on the rest, the characters remember learning about the material and are able to uh, fill in the rest of the letters. So again, your character might be able to remember that bronze wood exists. We don't know what it does officially in 5e, but it exists. You learn from the puzzle. Or, or the perception check notices that the daggers in the shop look exactly like those in the notes. So, and then customizing, right? Extend the puzzle and incorporate it more into your campaign by requiring characters to speak to other townsfolk to learn about Clegg's background and discover he settled into this town as a weaponsmith after years of clerical service to his god, Morden, right? We know Morden's part of the puzzle. So there you go. I'll put a link again in the description to that if you want to go and pick that up. So thank you all so much for coming on this journey with me. This very long, this is a lot longer than I thought this video was going to be, but I kind of went on a diatribe about puzzles, which I probably didn't have to do. Um, but yeah, we've covered Tasha's Cauldron of Everything from start to finish. Uh, I took a, it's a lot of videos. I don't even know how many videos it was. And like I said, I still have two more to go, kind of touching on Tasha's Cauldron specifically, and then one to talk about sort of fixing the sorcerer, which is sort of a part three of an existing series. but. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. We will get back to regularly scheduled nerd immersion based content this coming week, uh, which will be nice, which is, you know, I don't really have any regularly scheduled stuff other than the top tens on Tuesday. Uh, and I did want to do a holiday giveaway. I had planned to do a holiday giveaway uh, and at this old dungeon where I teach you how to build some stuff. I am still going to do that. It just obviously won't. It'll be holiday themed, but it'll be after the holiday. So uh, you guys want to learn how to build some dice towers out of wood and out of plexiglass and other stuff. we got a couple videos coming in the near future. So stay tuned to the channel for that. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you all next time.